Okay, uh, hello everyone. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to get away from the, the present day. I'm a historian, so I'm going to take us back to the 1960s, to the swinging 60s, pre-Troubles, pre-Brexit. And we're going to go back to the, uh, the original application for Ireland to join the EEC. And I want to talk about various contexts uh, with that. First of all, the Cold War, the big context of the agricultural marketplace, the UN, and of course, Northern Ireland. And a lot of the material from this talk, and I, I will be brief, is from a biography I did of Sean Lamass, a uh, great Irish teacher, great Irish leader in the 20th century. And his decision to orient the Fianna Fáil government towards the EEC in the 60s was the clearest break yet from protectionism in Ireland. It's a, a huge U-turn at the time. If you think about Irish history, Lamas himself, under de Valera's premiership, had constructed an entire uh, protectionist system. And then when he comes into power in 59 as Taoiseach, he's disestablishing that. So in the early... Uh, period of Ireland seeking membership of the EEC, 58-59, uh, there's a big context, and that, of course, is the Cold War. The Catholic Church, of course, was a huge power broker in Ireland at this time. Uh, Cardinal John Dalton, the head of the Catholic Church in Ireland at the time, uh, had actually proposed that Ireland rejoin the Commonwealth because of the context of the war on communism. The Knights of Columbanus, an often overlooked and fairly shadowy Catholic society with, with influence in the cause of power in Dublin, uh, also uh, welcomed British initiatives, uh, the EFTA, the Economic Free Trade Area, as a bulwark against communism and said that Ireland should be looking in that direction. And even Eamon de Valera, the sort of colossus of the Irish 20th century prior to his retirement, was actually sounding out British opinion on a united Ireland joining the Commonwealth. We know that now. For Sean Lamas, however, who comes to power in 1959, the European common market was always the more attractive option. He didn't want to sacrifice precious Anglo-Irish trade especially agricultural trade, uh, by going in too quickly. But for Lamas, who considered the Commonwealth option, he considered the EFTA, the European Free Trade Area, but membership for Lamas <laughs> of a free trade Europe raised the possibility of ending dependence on the British market. And that, if we place ourselves in the shoes of the nationalist policymakers and, and architects of Irish independence, was the consistent long-term goal of them, ending that dependence on the British market. Paradoxically, of course, Ireland's very application in the 60s rested on the success of Britons. Effectively, Ireland could only join the club by hanging on to Britain's coattails. If we look at files, and just to quote briefly from some British files at the time, from 1959 and 60, held in Q, quote, We need to be at pains in not giving the Irish too raw a deal. They are a very substantial market of ours. They provide a substantial amount of our labour force. And we are, of course, one of the greatest countries in terms of importance for their cattle. So that's the British consideration at the time. These are cabinet memos, by the way. At the same time, Britain uh, knows that Ireland can't too hastily join the EEC. And another secret file we have at the time says, quote, a hint was dropped to the Irish that the Irish, as a peripheral, must not go very fast in giving up protection for their industry. Now, British opinion at this time is, uh, the context is the wariness around the six, the original six countries who had established a European common market in 1957, of course, as you know, the Treaty of Rome, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. Britain is keen to maintain existing bilateral trade arrangements with Ireland, doesn't want to jeopardise these by committing too quick to the fast-track abolition of tariffs. British negotiators also recognise that abolishing tariffs too quickly could be very damaging for La Masse and Ireland. I want to rush on quite quickly to the United Nations, which is another key context, because up until the 60s and Ireland's application to join the EEC, Ireland really pursues a non-aligned and very independent stance at the UN, often voting with the Scandinavian delegations, with the African delegations. It's after April 1961 that the Irish delegation unequivocally abandons its overtly activist role in favour of one more sympathetic to its European allies and indeed the American government. Why the policy shift? Of course it's because of that application to join the EEC in July 1961. And Le uh, in uh, September 1961, dispatched officials to the capitals of the six EEC member states to clarify various aspects of the Irish EEC application. So what Lamas as Taoiseach realises is that Ireland is going to have to uh, abandon or at least um, uh, tone down its independent stance at the UN, if not uh, for assuaging the American opinion, for uh, looking to political cooperation. In September 61, for example, Lamas writes to his uh, Foreign Minister Frank Aiken, that in the interest of retaining Italian goodwill during the EEC negotiations, Ireland should stop uh, being outspoken on South Tyrol. South Tyrol, of course, seeking independence at that period. 
Now, in terms of Lamas and the British, uh, Harold Macmillan, who's the Prime Minister at the time, while all this is going on, said he found Lamas very helpful. And the British view Lamas as much more someone who they can do business with than de Valera, who they always view as, as really the head member of the awkward squad. And yet this sort of overblown dichotomy between de Valera and Lamas, uh, well, it is overblown. Because, again, Lamas views, to, to reiterate this point, common market Europe as the long-term term option, not the EFTA, because, similar to de Valera, and they're of the same uh, 1916 ilk, the ending of dependency on Britain was the key goal. Uh, so in uh, 1962, January the 18th, Lamas presents Ireland's application to join the EEC. My third big context, penultimately, is the agricultural marketplace, and this is still, of course, important to this day. The National Farmers Association, uh, which is a big uh, lobby group in Ireland at the time, which Fianna Fáil, the Masses Party, uh, famously when the NFA uh, went on strike outside government buildings later that year around the EEC membership issues and, and loss of the British market, uh, they contemptuously dubbed the National Farmers Association the NFA, the Nine Frozen Arses, because they're outside government buildings for so long. So there was a, there was a degree of political animosity there towards the, towards the big... I mean, in, you know, you'll know the Irish political divides in terms of the big farming interest there. Uh, but the NFA is actually urging Ireland to join without Britain at the time. So Lamas is actually stirring a more pragmatic course. Uh, and Lamas knows, as the MP for South Fermanagh, uh, Cara Healy, writes in January 1962, quote, has Lamas any alternative markets for his cattle, pork and eggs? And the answer, of course, was no. There, there was a huge dependence on the British market. Now, these con concerns about the, the British marketplace for Irish agricultural produce are somewhat blown out of the water when Charles de Gaulle vetoes the British and with it the Irish entry to the EEC. As a footnote, of course, de Gaulle, uh, in describing why he, he vetoes Britain and Ireland, describes Britain as insular, maritime. Uh, the crux uh, of his point, de Gaulle, is that Britain is industrial and commercial and only slightly agricultural, differing profoundly to the rest of the nations in the six at the time. Of course, the same couldn't be said for Ireland at that time. But wearily, Lamas uh, goes back to the British and with the coming to power of Harold Wilson's Labour Party, uh, finds a sympathetic ear and eventually we get the Irish, uh, Anglo-Irish Free Trade Agreement in 1965. So my final context, of course, with all of this, and what, something which looms massively today, of course, is Northern Ireland. Now, Lamas is significant as an Irish Prime Minister because he replaces the term six counties with Northern Ireland in official parlance. And that doesn't seem like much, but it really is a very marked evolution of language. It's more acceptable to the unionist community. So if we you know, are a little bit ahistorical and we take out the context of the Troubles and Good Friday Agreement and everything, you can see at this early stage this slow march towards peace, if you like, in Northern Ireland. In April 1963, Lamas likes to use uh, what, what he calls, he likes to fly kites. And I'm sure some of you from the political world will understand what he means this, using junior ministers or, or backbench MPs to, to sort of float ideas. And he uses George Colley, one of his uh, backbenchers at the time, to float the idea that independent Ireland had always recognised Northern Ireland de facto in reality, if not de jure legally. The response from Stormont is muted. He then, Lamas, uses his uh, son-in-law, uh, the, the famous or infamous uh, Charles Hawhey, uh, to make similar uh, overtures to Stormont, again a negative response. But it's in September 1963 that the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, Terence O'Neill, makes a conciliatory speech. Lamas then immediately moves uh, to get his government departments to draw up a list of areas of practical cross-border co collaboration. At the same time, we can't be uh, ahistorical in viewing this. Lamas, of course, is in some ways uh, you know, a beacon of, of future peace initiatives. But in October of that same year, he sets off to the United States and he upsets Unionists in Northern Ireland because in a speech in Boston, he invokes Abraham Lincoln's famous speech when, in, when inaugurated the president in 1861, when he says uh, that uh, no minority has the right uh, to vote themselves out of a nation. So Lamas at the time, his conception of the nature of partition, uh, it, it, speaking to an Irish audience, he's going to make overtures, as, as he views it, uh, to the unionists. In America, on foreign soil, the colonial occupier Britain would be his focus. And we can't be too ahistorical in sort of seeing Lamas as a beacon of the, you know, the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, which happens a lot later. The Lamas O'Neill uh, meetings that happened in 1965, of course, are very significant. And I'll finish off with this because they're the first time, or the last time rather, the Prime Ministers of Northern Ireland, of Ireland's two states, meet officially until the Bertie O'Hearney and Paisley handshake in 2007. Consequently, if you read the history, there's an air of breathless, almost 50 shades of grey literary romance about it. Uh, a cold January morning, we have a single black Mercedes carrying Lamas, uh, winding its way through the snow to Belfast. O'Neill is waiting on the steps of Stormont on tippy-toes. 
Uh, one historian says, Lamas didn't tell his wife, O'Neill didn't tell his wife, and the two premieres marked the occasion with champagne. Of course, there was a lot of more boring context regarding that, the, the mutual presence of British and Irish representatives at the IMF, the British Labour government under Harold Wilson in 64. But to, prove, uh, to, to really underline my point, most significantly was the context of moves towards European integration. And Lamas stated in an interview with the BBC at the time, the political implications of the border, and I quote, will diminish very considerably when we are all in the European free trade area. So I've taken you on a bit of a, uh, a breakneck uh, little, uh, well, it's fitting, I suppose, that we start off with the history and start off with the 60s and the original uh, application to join. We're fast forwarding to today to Britain, um, the UK rather extricating itself from Europe. Uh, I haven't had time, of course, to mention the Irish accession in 1973 and its indisputable benefits to Ireland. But I hope that this very brief history of Ireland's original application of Le Mas, the man who argued for Ireland's future within uh, a Europe, a free trade Europe, illustrates why Ireland aligning itself today uh, so closely with the European Union in current negotiations uh, is perhaps very understandable. Thank you very much.